All right. Hello and welcome back uh, to this recorded event for uh, the 2024 Preservation Week. Uh, my name is Sean Ferguson. I'm a co-chair of the Preservation Outreach Committee, and I'm joined here today by Tracy Sorrell, our honorary chair for Preservation Week 2024. Uh, Tracy is an award-winning children's book and young adult author. Uh, she is uh, a member of the Cherokee Nation, uh, and she is also, uh, in a previous life, a uh, an Indigenous law attorney. Uh, there are so many aspects of your career that I find fascinating, uh, and today we are honored to have you here to talk uh, a bit about uh, the book that we just heard you reading, uh, if you're joining us during Preservation Week, uh, Being Home, uh, your new upcoming book. Uh, and we're also here to talk about uh, the theme of Preservation Week this year, um, mm -hmm. preserving identities. Uh, we are so honored to have you, Tracy. Thank you so much for joining us. Yeah, Sean, I'm I'm honored to be here, and I look forward to our conversation. Well, the uh, the the reading was beautiful. Those illustrations were beautiful. Your words were beautiful. I enjoyed uh, listening to Being Home, and maybe the first question I have about it to kick off this conversation. When I think about um, a young girl moving or anyone moving, especially in sort of a, like a children's book or young adult book context, I think of anxiety. I think of the change that that brings about. But this story was not about anxiety. This was a story about um, someone returning, it sounded like, to a place where they really felt at home, the opposite. Yes. Um, how did you feel inspired to take that sort of story in that direction? Well, like many, you know, story ideas, right? They come from different places. And um, my son is actually the one that inspired this. So mm -hmm. we were living in Kansas City at the time, and we would come um, back to the Cherokee Nation Reservation. So for those of you who don't know, that's located in northeastern Oklahoma, spread over 14 counties. If you look on a map and you find Tulsa, um, pretty much anything east, a little north, south of there is um, the Cherokee Nation Reservation. So we'd come home to visit um, his aunt and uncle, my brother and uh, sister. And he goes, why do we have to go back? Why can't we just stay here? And he just kept saying that. And I said, well, you know, first of all, um, your father's work, you know, has us in Kansas City. And at that time, um he hadn't been approved for remote work. Um, he had colleagues who were working remotely, but he wasn't. And this was in, um, you know, 2016, 2017. Finally, in 2018, he is approved for, for work. But, but every time we would come home, that's what he would say. And I thought to myself, you know, this child has never lived. He's the first generation since the forced removal of Cherokee people from our southeastern homelands to you know what is um now our reservation here was within indian territory much later on becomes the state of oklahoma he's the first generation born outside of that you know so he's been here many times but never lived here but just such enthusiasm and and wanting to be home you know that that it, this is his home right of his ancestors and so I thought, you know, to your point, like the majority of stories are these, these horrible like moves, right? And there's always some discomfort in moving. But even as a child growing up on the reservation here, we moved to numerous small towns. Wherever my parents had better work, that's where we went to. And my mom always made it seem like an adventure because we were all together. You know, so I didn't have the the trepidations and I've never had the trepidations about moving. I know it's, you know, it's work involved. And so to see that from him, I was like, man, that that's a story right there. So thus being home was born. And um, I love what Michaela has done in creating the art, right? Because for every picture book, you know, for those of you who may not be familiar and read a lot of picture books, the story is more than half told in the art. And so to be um, having, you know, Caldecott medalist and honoree Michaela Goad um, bring her vision to this story is incredible, you know, and I love that she has this young girl who's, um, you know, clearly a budding illustrator, you know, who's drawing and, and making sense of all of this as they go um, is just another layer of, of beauty to the story. So um, I, I was delighted when I saw the sketches and then when I saw the full color art, I was like, ah, oh, wow. 
So it's, it's, um, it's a celebration. It really is um, in, in so many ways. We will have been home almost six years now um, to come, come this fall. And that's, that's exciting. Mm. Oh, I love that. I, and um, for you to bring up the illustrator of this work, I was thinking of those illustrations too, and how many traits of the protagonist are really borne out in those illustrations. What is the process for in, in working on a book like this with your with your illustrator, your colleague in this endeavor, mm -hmm. as a person who is not um part of the um well the children's book writing community, and <laughs> I'm not an author myself for a lay person, how does that work? No. Um, I, you know, I mean, I will say, you know, for those people that self-publish, it's a little bit different, right? Because you do, um, if you are paying for all the costs, then, then certainly you're looking at, um, finding an illustrator and putting that person in place. Um, in the trade publishing world, the publisher in essence is buying my words, right? And they will find an illustrator to create the art, mm -hmm. um, for native authors and illustrators, oftentimes though you will be asked um, who your, you know, who you would have on a list of people, mm -hmm. and uh, because a lot of the publishing houses don't know, I think you know now in the last couple of years, um, and I've been very good about sharing contact information of native artists with publishing houses that are interested to have people to select as illustrators, but. Prior to that, not so much. And so, you know, you would definitely be more involved. But once that that process gets underway, and like I say, the, the publishing house has said, you know, we want to, to buy your text and, and create a book. Um, typically speaking, in a normal, regular type book, you have no involvement because you're not going to what inform the illustrator how to draw trucks that are the protagonist or you know other I mean you know you're just not um with native stories it's a little different mm. because oftentimes even if you're paired with a native illustrator um they're not from the same tribal background as you are mm. and so therefore um you know there needs to be some assistance given and in this case um I said to, you know, I had talked to Michaela actually before, um, I had just, when I had, had sold this, this book to the, the publisher, I, I ran into her at ALA in, um, Washington, DC, we sat and had lunch and I had seen her work. This is before, this is ALA in 2019. So it's before we are water protectors ever comes out. And, um, I had seen her work for the C Alaska heritage Institute that the American Indian library association had awarded um several times and i said wow your art is just so gorgeous i said would you at all be interested in um this story i said a fictional story about a young child and i didn't you know specify gender or anything i mean i did tell her it was you know inspired by my son but i said you know in, in moving home and um she said you know send me the text so i did and um and she said yeah you know i'd love to be considered so i'd put her on the publisher's list of people to consider and, and then they informed me later that um, they also loved her style and wanted to, to work with her. She agreed. And so at that point, you know, she's living, of course, right in within the Clinket and Haida nations in Southeast Alaska. It's a very different terrain from um, also a wooded area where I live, you know, lots of creeks, rivers, um, but not mountains and trees meeting the sea like where she lives. And so um, I sent her lots of photos of the area and went around and, and took pictures so that she would see the flora, the fauna. Um, and um, the Cherokee Nation citizenry looks from blonde hair, blue eyed to black. You know, that's just that's who our people are. And that needs to be represented, you know, as well in the uh, the art. So um, I did not, you know, tell her what to create. That's all her vision. Um, I just merely sent photos of here's kind of your setting and your scene, right? Because every book, unless you're creating a fake world, right? And, and fantasy or um, stuff, it, there is a place, right? There are people from that place. It's, it's tied to um, a history. And so you want someone to, who is 
from that place, opening that book and looking at it to go, yes, that looks like this place, you know, or when an event's happened, yes, that is what happened during that event. And so even though it's a fictional book, it still needs to be authentic. Mm -hmm. And so um, I wanted her knowing that, you know, it's not easy to, to get from where she's at to where I'm at and it's costly to, to have the ability to, you know, with some assistance for research. And I do that with any book that I, um, write, you know, I make files available to the editor to send on again, photos, whatever is, is necessary, um, just to help them not start from scratch. Cause they are carrying the majority of the work in the book over, over 50%. And so anything I can do to, to help them in that process, I definitely want to do. Mm, I see. It sounds like because it's a Native American work, it necessitates a higher level of collaboration. Uh, yeah. And also, you know, when I get um, sketches and, and the final art, I mean, I show it to other people, right? Because no one person is the wisdom keeper, the culture keeper of everyone. You can't take on that kind of role. Like it's bookmaking is a team sport, and it's a team sport, not just with the publisher, or with the illustrator, but a whole team of people that are beyond that. And so from the time I'm creating a text to, like I say, through that whole process, there are other people that we weigh in because, um, as I tell students when I do school visits, you know, I feel like my job as um, a writer and sharing these stories and creating stories for them is to first do no harm, just like in a physician takes that oath, you know. And so I don't want to um, have things in the art or in the text that could be othering, could be um, alienating to anyone, you know, could be disrespectful. Mm -hmm. Because it, even if something may be your own story, it may not represent everyone's story right. in a way that feels right. true. Right. Yeah. I know. And again, you know, there are people who know more than me, right, who are Cherokee, who would say that that image is not, you know, good to have in here. Or, you know, you could phrase this another way and, and still get your point across, but be more inclusive, et cetera, of, you know, how we would say that in our language, et cetera. I see. I see. It really uh, carries home for me the team sport, as you said, nature of the endeavor, and, and I know because this is preservation week and thinking about or, uh, preserving identities as the theme, I, I think about how storytelling is in its own way, an act of preservation, right? Passing yes. on information from one yes. generation to the next. And having read at least a handful of your other books, I know that you've got a tendency to write nonfiction too, right? Like that's many mm -hmm. of your books. Uh, yeah. Some of my favorite books I've read so far by you are nonfiction. Uh, and I think about how one could easily say, yeah, I'm. Uh, these are facts that I like, you know, stories about a person that really existed that I'm passing on the knowledge of to other people through this work. But when you're writing a book like this, like Being Home, it's fiction, right? Also, although inspired by true events mm -hmm. in your life, your son's life. Uh, I wonder um, how a work of fiction also serves as a means of preserving and passing on information mm -hmm. to to another generation, to another audience. Well, um, you know, if we look at, again, our history, so there's just displacement from the Southeast to um, what is um, our reservation here now within Northeastern Oklahoma. But um, not long after that, the federal government really kind of doubles down on assimilationist policies, mm -hmm. taking young children from families, putting them in boarding schools. So they're not raised in a family environment. They're not speaking the language. They're not learning the cultural ways, all in an attempt to whitewash them, right. And to alienate them from um, their family environment, which worked very effectively for many, many native nations across the country. Cherokee people, you know, were not immune to these things, of course. And, um, Later on, you know, there's uh, relocation programs in the 1940s to 60s where the federal government is moving Native families out of their tribal lands and into cities, right? So in this story, we have um, a young girl and her mother who are moving back. Now, we don't know if mom has, you know, um, gone out there for a job or she's 
been, you know, there for educational purposes. And let's say she's, you know, finished her graduate degree or whatever it is. Right. But, but now they are, they are moving home. And that is for me really also, in addition to my own family's experience, really documenting what is happening to many people across the country is that they are able to move back home because we've seen economic development and the ability of tribes to have a variety of opportunities for people to come home and make a living, Mm. you know, whether they have their own business there, they've got different tribal industries. Our tribe is got a wide array of opportunities available for people. And so a lot of people are able to move home so that their children are immersed in our language, our culture, and, um, and, and having that centered in a way that is not centered living in a much larger city, you know? Um, so it's, it's really also documenting a current, um, not phenomenon, but a, a current reality that we see of, of yeah. people moving home and young people being able to, um, enjoy being, like I say, immersed in, in the, in the culture. My son, you know, since we've moved home, he, he goes to the Cherokee, uh, nation's language immersion school. He yeah. sings with the Cherokee national youth choir, which also performs and sings in the Cherokee language. It, it's been, a, a wonderful, wonderful experience. And then just also, um, growing up in a more rural environment, uh, like I did, you know, until I was a teen and, um, getting to just experience that, you know, tempo of life and rhythm as mm. well. Mm. I, um, when I, uh, when I read another one of your books at the mountains base, I sensed mm-hmm. also the importance of home, a home. Mm-hmm. And I thought about, if we're thinking of preservation, one of the places where knowledge is transmitted is like in a reading room, like at a university. And I thought Mm -hmm. the home feels like in your works, kind of like a reading room in some ways Mm -hmm. of transmission of knowledge between parties. And that's exactly how you've, I think, described it. I wonder what, what is really gained when you sort of take that, that transmission of knowledge um, from one to another out of, say, a place like the reading room and take it into some place more personal where family exists, where work is done, mm-hmm. where uh, crafts are, are uh, mm-hmm. made. I, I think I'm, I'm kind of interested in that analogy and a bit mm-hmm. about where you see the home in the place of preservation. Yeah, I mean, again, I think, um, you know, one of my powerful experiences in my it was mid twenties. I was interning at the national museum of the American Indian. I was working for Dr. Charlotte Heth, who's now retired. She had been an ethnomusicologist at UCLA for a number of years. She's a Cherokee nation citizen and lives here again in, uh, not on the reservation, but here, um, in Oklahoma. And, but at the time she was employed by NMAI and she was a, um, director there overseeing some programs. And she asked me, she was working on a side research project on researching Cherokee hymns. And she said, I need you to go to the Library of Congress, to various, you know, the archives and national archives and other places and find anything you can on Cherokee people singing hymns, any recordings, you know, et cetera, because I want to make sure I have a full bibliography of all the sources. Mm -hmm. And so it was amazing to sit at the Library of Congress and listen to Cherokee people singing and talking and thinking, wow, I have this immediate connection to these ancestors, Mm -hmm. right? Now I fast forward all these years later, here it is, you know, (laughs) we're in the 21st century because I'm no longer in my mid twenties. And my son is singing hymns in Cherokee, you know, traditional songs in Cherokee, also Motown songs in Cherokee, <laughs> um, you know, and Cool in the Gang, Celebration, et cetera, and, and sharing those. And um, just that thread that keeps us all together, that we're all united, we're all um, part of a continuous um, storytelling and community reinforcing body of people and spirits is just incredible. It's just incredible. So it's, it's important to, like I say, you know, for me, when I was approached about 
being the preservation week chair, I was like, yes, you know, I think about um, the sacrifices of many people who thought, um, what if, you know, we are, I mean, because what was, you know, many people may not know, but a lot of the rhetoric and a lot of the actions taken um, against Native people in the 1800s and especially in the early 1900s was of, here's the vanishing Indian. We've got to record these people. You know, you're not going to be here any longer. It's important for us to get your story down. Horrible, horrible, you yeah. know, way to, to approach things. But people were very conscious of those things. So I think about the sacrifices that people made to share those stories and what their thoughts were around many times sharing those stories and how important it is to help people who are represented, right, who descend from those folks to have access to those unfettered access that they can, um, again, continue that storytelling, continue that connection and have their identity reinforced, bolstered, you know, cherished um, and honoring that sacrifice that, you know, their, their ancestors made in, in going through that whole, that whole process, because um, we are still here mm. and we're always going to be here. And it's important for us to have that continuous connection maintained, not just for today, but for all of our young people that are, are here now, but also those that come after them. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm hearing that in, in the past and perhaps in some ways, even today, there's acts of preservation that are harmful, that cause harm to community, right? And yeah. I guess I'm... I'm curious, uh, since you've had such an experience working in both archives, working in storytelling, you see uh, your son uh, learning the Cherokee language, and that's also an act of preservation, right? Mm -hmm. I guess I'm curious where you see or what you would like to see in the future in terms of uh, improving preservation work in a way that um, negates that harm. Mm -hmm. tries to repair um yeah. because i know it, it takes all parties involved uh, it does to try to do that type of reparative work it does it takes um you know a commitment for people to be extremely humble yeah. and to not center um maybe the pedagogy that you've been taught you know um in in the university or in in your professional environment you know and and really look at um who's cultural knowledge do we have here? You know, whose cultural um, material culture do we have in, in our archives, you know? Um, because those songs are living and those um, stories are living, you know, they are, again, um, an integral part of who we are as people. And so it's important that Cherokee people, if it's Cherokee or whoever has the ability to to access those things, and it's it's it ties along the lines with the Native American Graves um, Protection and Repatriation Act, right? I mean, Native nations, you know, brought that to the forefront and said to the U.S. government, "Look, you know, our relatives, it's it's disrespectful. They're they're being housed. Their their, you know, remains have been separated." all these funerary objects, what, what is going on here? We need to properly take care of our ancestors mm -hmm. and your values are absolutely not in sync with ours. And this is, this is disrespectful. And so to find in the 21st century that we still have institutions dragging their feet and not doing the right thing. It's like, it's absolutely egregious. And, and, and in my view, diabolical mm -hmm. that this would continue to go on when the law is is so old. My mother um, used to serve as the NAGPRA coordinator for the Bureau of Indian Affairs and, you know, worked along with many others to get those things out of the Bureau, but that's not the case in other places, right? Um, and again, why? Why do you persist in, in doing this? Why um, do you put roadblocks up that allow people to access recordings, the documents, et cetera. Mm -hmm. um, those things, you know, many native nations have wonderful archives, museums, cultural centers, and, um, and they can house those things. They can take care of those things and make them accessible to 
people who know what those, you know, stories mean, know what those songs mean, would benefit from, you know, hearing those on a regular basis. We're not just people to be studied or objectified, which often has been um, the reason, of course, those things were collected. Or again, that whole vanishing Indian myth mm -hmm. of, well, you'll no longer be here. So this will be our way of um, having you for time immemorial. Mm -hmm. It's like, no, people are very much still here. And, and we need to ensure that those who are still here and those yet to come have um, the ability to, to continue ourselves, you know, with um, all the knowledge that, that we have now and, and the knowledge that our ancestors um, have laid down on, you know, vinyl or um, other tapes or in documents, et cetera, um, for us. Mm -hmm. One of the things that I was thinking about as I was listening to your reading um, and thinking about also the work you've done in archives, I think of sometimes at an institution uh, when you're thinking about preservation, like children don't really factor in, like you don't think about kids being in a reading room, right? Um, but uh, of course, in your work, I think of the work of writing these books as an act of preservation and children are central to it. Mm -hmm. um, do you feel like when you bring, do you think of children as little preservationists in a way? Are they an integral role to preservation? A absolutely. I mean, um, so again, if if we're playing a recording, right, mm -hmm. of, of listening to someone who's singing a song or whatever, you know, there are so many tribes that ha are reclaiming their languages. Mm -hmm. You know, that era of we will not speak our language, you know, um, because we're going to be punished to do so in schools or we've been taken from our community. We're not in that place any longer, right? So these materials that have been recorded, right, these stories, these songs are of utmost importance mm -hmm. now because it allows you to, you know, show to those children, hey, you are continuing exactly what your ancestors have done. They sold, you know, sang the songs, they told stories, you are doing that now. Mm -hmm. And in a way you're honoring them, you're honoring us here now, you're paving the way, you're, you know, um, pushing us into the future, right? And helping us and you'll add your own stories to that. So for me, I feel like I'm just one of many, 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 many people who are in a continuous line of sharing stories, right? That so many people have done that before me. I'm not the first Cherokee person to have done anything, right? So many people have written, so many people have, you know, um, shared stories, shared songs, have recorded their thoughts, et cetera. And so I'm, I'm merely one of millions of people throughout time, right? Who have done that. Um, but I want to encourage young people to find sustenance and to find um, comfort and enjoyment out of those stories, out of those songs and, and feel like, yes, you know what? I, I have something to contribute to because we all have gifts and talents that mm -hmm. we utilize, right? And hopefully we utilize those for the benefit of others and, and that they feel encouraged to, to continue that. So I don't, see myself or, or them as, as anything other than, you know, yes, preserving, but also adding to, mm -hmm. and then being a source of encouragement for those that come after us to share their stories, um, share their songs, share their ways of being, uh, as we move forward and, and hopefully continue, um, continue ourselves collectively <laughs> on the planet in the, in the future. Mm -hmm. It's, um, when you say adding to, it makes me think of a, uh, the life of maybe a, a song, a ritual, a practice, being able to continue to go on after uh, it's gained some sort of historical import as well. And maybe sometimes in an archival context, um, one can be considered to be doing a very good job if kind of like the story of the artifact stays static once it's inside the archives. It may inform scholarship, but it doesn't, ch itself doesn't change, right? Yeah. Um, and that to me sounds like a very, um, like a, a shift in paradigm for thinking mm -hmm. about preservation yeah. when you bring more people into it. Yeah, and you know, um, I mean, you could take 
an old song and say, oh, you know, this is how we sing it now, right? It's that basis of, of study and comparison or, oh, you know what, we could add this to this, you know, this part of the story now, or this has been added, you know, it's a way to, you know, from an act, let's say an academic or a study say, just, you know, study like what has been the evolutions in language. Oh, they use that word for then. Now we, now we use this word for that, right? Because we're always in flux. And yeah. so it's the ability to, to look at how were our ancestors communicating this? What's similar? What's changed now? You know, yeah. and then the ability for those who come after us to say, huh, look where, where we are now compared to, you know, where, what they were saying, what they were singing, what they were doing. Um, mm -hmm. and I, and I find those things fascinating just to see how, you know, we do grow and evolve, right? Nothing is, is static. The language that we use is, um, very different, but at the same time, there are things that are not, mm -hmm. you know, in our, in our worldview and our language as Cherokee people is very, very different from English. And so it's, it's critical, you know, it's, it's 80% verbs um, mm. and it has, you know, in English, it's a very quantified language. It's very value laden. You know, we will, the way we, we talk about things that doesn't even exist in, in Cherokee language, mm. you know? So um, it's important to, like I say, have your, your worldview, your way of being reinforced and, being able to read documents, listen to stories, listen to songs, all of those things help to give you that continuous connection to mm -hmm. um, those who've come before you and made the way for you to be here, who've prayed and loved you into being, and for you then to do the same for those coming after you, mm -hmm. for sure. Mm -hmm. um, I know through our conversation, we've talked about language preservation and mm -hmm. learning language. Uh, and it's a topic that I find very interesting and very, you know, uh, in my own studies, learning preservation work, it never really crossed my mind very much because that's mm -hmm. just in, in the types of materials that I encountered, it wasn't a component of it. And I feel as though when a language, um, and, and you could correct me if I'm wrong, but a language that is a little under threat, right? Like it's not mm -hmm. as secure as say the English language, for instance, there's this act of preservation of the language that is like this layer to the preservation work of the source material that it helps you understand. And so that, at least that's my understanding of it. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering how, how do you think that like storytelling and writing, writing your works helps contribute to that language preservation. Isn't, uh, I believe at least one of your works has been translated into Cherokee, right? Yes. Um, at the mountain's base mm -hmm. is, um, currently available as an ebook in Cherokee. Mm -hmm. And then I have a book coming in, um, August. Clack, clack, smack, a Cherokee stickball story. Mm -hmm. And this is going to have a completely Cherokee version as well. Mm. So I'm super excited about that. And both of those were translated by John Ross, who is a first language speaker and mm. works for the Cherokee Nation in the translation language department. But he does freelance translation with publishers um, outside of his work. And so um, we hired him for, for both of these stories. And um, it is important. You know, one of the things that I you know, as you mentioned earlier, I've, I've done a lot of different things in my life, um, you know, and I see myself as someone who is a perpetual student of, of life. And so my focus, um, because my son has um, taken so well with the language and mm. uh, just had a language competition yesterday um, with other students from other native nations, a language, native languages competition at University of Oklahoma. And his group won their um, age category. Uh, you know, I say, okay, I need to help support him in his language efforts. And so um, I'm, I'm devoting myself to working on my own Cherokee um, language acquisition because I have a very elementary level of knowledge now. 
But my, my goal is to be able to write stories, to be able to write songs in Cherokee myself as a way to not only, you know, because I love fiction and nonfiction, and, and I write both of those things. I want to be able to do that in Cherokee, you know, to write history, to write about people in our language, but also to, you know, write fictional stories as a way to contribute. Um, so many people now that study the language, you know, they look for reading materials. And so um, sometimes you're able to find letters from people that are written in the Cherokee syllabary. Um, and so groups will take those and like analyze them and see, you know, oh, what is the son writing to his mother? You know, that they've again found in archives or different places, different collections. And so it's it's important um, to be able to, like I say, access those pieces and use them for group language study and yeah. to talk, you know, figure out how are families talking, how are people talking in, you know, our tribal newspaper, which oftentimes um has the articles in our language, both historically and still currently. Mm -hmm. um, but at the same time to add new stories, right? To add to add new um, historical accounts, writings about things, as well as um, fictional stories. And so um, that's my, my new challenge moving forward is to, um, to work on that with um, other Cherokee folks. And I'm excited about that. Uh, that uh, one of my question was going to be, what are your hopes for the future in your own work? Uh, and yeah. that sounds like a beautiful goal. Um, yeah. Your reference to those archival materials makes me think of like the National Breath of Life project at the University of Miami. I believe they do such a wonderful job with archival mm -hmm. collecting of language sources for the purpose mm -hmm. of revitalization of language. Um, I know we're, we might be coming a little bit to the end of our time on our discussion Mm -hmm. And I just wanted to leave space for you to say anything you might like that maybe we haven't covered about the theme of preserving identities mm -hmm. or something else you're aspiring to in the future. Um, I've gotten from this conversation, um, I think, a, a, a sense that the work of preservation needs to change, that there are frameworks that need to be rethought. Uh, and that there's a lot to be gained by bringing more and more people to the table uh, to change the modalities of preservation. Um, and I've also just loved speaking with you about your work, about these books. Uh, it's a pleasure. So please, I want to leave the floor to you uh, to share any thoughts you have, finally, to, to sort of wrap us up. Yeah, I would... Um just in invite everyone encourage maybe kick in the pants um folks to really approach this work with a great deal of humility and to think about again re regardless of of what you've been taught regardless of how you walk in the world or others um, say that you should walk in the world of preservation um, understand that the collections that you have, um, that you care for, that you oversee, represent real people. Mm -hmm. They represent real history. And those are of critical importance to the people that they represent. Mm -hmm. And so operating from a place of first doing no harm, and that's harm in the eyes of the people that are represented. And secondly, like I say, reaching out and in a good, um, in a good way, in good relationship to make those stories, songs, documents as accessible as possible, um, returning them where you can to the care of, of those who they represent is, is critical. You know, ultimately, if we don't focus on our collective humanity, you know, our shared experience here, um, we're, we're not going to make it, you know, and I want us to operate from a place of hope and encouragement for our young people, but it takes us as, as the grownups, as the adults to set that example. And I feel like we have a lot of work to do in that area collectively across the board, but certainly in your work, this is, this is one way that you, you can do that is to, to understand that you are, assisting 
in the continuance, right? That has always been there, is here now, and, and will be there. And that's that's a part that is is important and it's it's critical for you to play. And so I just invite you to um to take that journey and to do that work. It's it's um it's of fundamental importance to all of us. Wado, thank you. Thank you so much, Tracy, for that message and for this conversation. It has been such a pleasure to have you today. Uh, and I wish everybody listening a good preservation week. Uh, and I know uh, ears are open and listening and learning. So thank you. Well, thank you for having me.